one. Friday night edition of the Anaheim Calling Podcast. We are back to discuss a Ducks defeat 6-1 to one at the hand of the Calgary Flames. One of the last games of the season. Man, we are... We are just about at the end here. Uh, the Ducks playing tonight with now just three games left on the schedule. And so this is our, what is it, third to last podcast, or I guess fourth to last podcast of the season post-game show. Yeah, fourth to last. Fourth to last. So although up, begins. Although tomorrow's game up in the air, it may be on Sunday, actually. But still, well, that will be it, a post-game. So it, it gets counted the same for, for our statistical fair analysis enough, fair here. <laughs> um, so not a whole lot of news to report from tonight, or at least before tonight's game. Basically, the Ducks are, I don't want to say they're tanking the rest of the season, but it looks as though they're getting the kind of a jump on some of the some of the injuries, some of the issues that they want to fix before going into next year. So Getzlaff out before tonight. Manson as well as Richie. Now, Manson, you could have kind of seen that one coming, right? Simply because, um, you know, of the way last game ended. Uh, but then Ryan Getzlaff, um, you know, I mean, he's he's getting looked at. Same thing with Nick Richie. So it just kind of feels like if these games really mattered, maybe two of those guys are playing. Yeah, you think they may try to battle through it a little bit. I don't know though. I mean, you don't want to speculate because we have no idea. Well, yeah, how I mean, serious I know you don't want to. I, I know you don't want to speculate, but I. You think tonight was do or die? You think they're they're shut down because least, the season's I think, over? I think at least one. Well, it, it's, it's I don't think they're getting shut down because they want to lose these games. I just think they're they're getting shut down because the Ducks realize you know there's not a whole lot to be gained by playing these guys yeah. big picture wise. So let's just get them a little rest. I just, and I think that, and by the way, I think that that's smart. I, I, I oh, think it that it makes sense is. to do that. Mm-hmm. So credit to the Ducks who actually are kind of following through on being a retooling team, a rebuilding team, whatever it is that you want to call it. Much debate over that terminology over the course of the season. And then the other thing to announce before we get into the recap to tonight's game, although uh, just as a forewarning, it's going to be pretty much a Calgary Flames recap for, for the most part. Final score, 6-1. to one. Um, Patrick Eves, nominee for the Bill Masterton Memorial Trophy by the Anaheim chapter of the Professional Hockey Writers Association. Uh, this is for the player who exemplifies perseverance, sportsmanship, and dedication to the sport of hockey. Surprised? Not one bit. To me... No Ryan Kessler love. <laughs> you only get one person that you can nominate. And I'm sorry, Ryan Kessler. Having a uh, hip surgery and all that stuff does not compare to a guy coming back from what was Guillain-Barre syndrome to then realizing it was misdiagnosed to be some sort of antiviral uh, whatever... or. Uh, auto, sorry, not antiviral, autoimmune uh, sort of disease um, and um, be able to work his way back. Yes, he was not able to consistently stay in the lineup. Yes, they had to put him on waivers, but that is exactly what the Master 10 Award is there for, to honor the people that have kept pushing and kept fighting and shown their dedication to hockey um, by keeping on playing pretty much and working back into the lineups. So my question is, who was the nominee last year? What, did they not have a nominee last year? I'm pretty sure. I probably was Andrew Cogliano would be my bet. Okay. Well, it, was I'm, like, I'm gonna tr- it was like Andrew Cogliano every year for a good like four or five years. I, I'll look it up right now. Let's take a look here. Okay, yeah. While you look that up, uh, I'll, I'll touch on the Patrick Eve nomination. I mean, look, it makes sense uh, that they would go this route if indeed Cogliano was the guy last year. Um, you know, even for Patrick Eves to be playing professional hockey this year, even if it's not um, at the capacity I think that he would like and that his his fans would like, um, it's still a pretty big deal that he's back and playing in the NHL. So, you know, of course, hats off to him. Interesting that you are right. The Ducks did not name one last year. I guess that they had too many choices. <laughs> that's weird. I mean, I, that, yeah. That's kind of odd. Um, the winner last year, I believe was Brian Boyle. Yeah, he did win it last year. 
Um, and so, yeah, the Ducks just didn't win it last year, which is – or sorry, they didn't win it. They didn't nominate a guy last yeah, year. Yeah, which is interesting because it's, it's the Pro Hockey Writers Association for that specific chapter. Um, mm-hmm. Not every single chapter nominates right. a player. So it's every single team that uh, the Writers Association associated with that team nominates a player. So that's interesting that a player was not named for Anaheim. The Ducks and the Red Wings were the only two not to do it last year. Right. And maybe part of that is because you have two guys on the team who you could kind of argue would be fitting that bill, both with Ryan Kessler and 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 Patrick Eves. Although Eves um, hadn't fully come back by that point in time. He had not. Uh, but that being said, you know, I mean, he I think you could still conceivably put him in there. Or maybe Ryan Kessler just didn't want his name to be in that hat, uh, you know, considering what Eves was going through. I don't know. I mean, we, we don't really know the reasons behind it. But all of this being said, certainly um, respect to Patrick Eves for, you know, again, he's not really playing a whole lot of hockey right now, even down in the minors. But the fact that he's even at a point where that's his biggest issue is a testament to the amount of work and just kind of the – the people that he's surrounded by, the medical staff. I mean, it's it's a team effort, and it's good to see that he's at least healthy again. So um, a worthy pick, I would say. Let me ask you this. Uh, if it weren't Kessler or Eves, who else, who else would you consider for this award from the Ducks? Ooh, I mean, I guess you would maybe say Corey Perry because of the knee injury. And working with so back, are we but, so so we're just agreeing it's the guy who was injured who came back. That, I mean that's usually what it is. Mm-hmm. That's usually what it is. Some guy that's thought mm-hmm. uh, had some hardship fall upon him and has worked his way back into the NHL lineup. Right. Yeah. I mean. I mean that does. And and again, I'm not trying to belittle that that line of thinking. You know, obviously it makes a lot of sense when you're looking at. Um, you know the how you would pick a guy. You know how do you how do you th- how do you judge dedication? And if you look at all the teams this year, I mean, it's all guys who are coming back um, or just guys who are, you know, just kind of providing that excellence. You know, if Corey Perry was having kind of like a standout season, I could, I could see it. Um, But as far as, as this year is concerned, um, I mean, you can make the case for Robin Lehner. That, that's a name that's been oh, thrown around. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's got certain, you know, the thing though, that I, I, I think Laner would be a great pick, but at the same time, you know, he kind of has the benefit of having it just completely put out there with the article, you know, and kind of the gory details, um, you know, whereas some guys don't choose to go that route. Um, I don't know. Would Andre Kasha be a candidate? Not this year. So he has to come back first. Yeah, that that's part of the that's part of the deal with <laughs> the trophy. The deal. <laughs> is you have to make the comeback. You have to figure out your way, or if right. you have to work right. back into it. And so that's part of it. And so yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those things where we'll see how the voting ends up. I think it. I think Eves is for sure going to be a finalist, and mm-hmm. I, I think he deserves the recognition, honestly, also for working back into an NHL lineup. Yeah, and also, I mean, he he is one of those guys who seems to be really well liked throughout the league. Yeah. You know, just just in terms of you know the the um, it's I believe he has that ping pong tournament he puts on the table yeah, tennis. Yeah, or I don't think he puts it on, but he plays in it as a big part of it every year. Right, right, and so I mean, it, it it's good for him. It's good for him. Um, okay, so let's get into tonight's game. Uh, we've already talked about the lineup changes halfway through the first period. Andy Walensky. First NHL goal, Andy Walensky, who, by the way, none other than Jake Rudolph. What did I do Really, now? really criticized last game. Um, and actually, the last few games criticized Walensky. He showed you tonight, Jake. He showed you. Oh, he, def- wanna- he definitely did with this goal and then proceeded to do everything that I said he did wrong the last couple of games. <laughs> I believe it was you who said a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago, that it doesn't look like... Andy Walensky is really even much of an NHL player at this point. I stand, I stand by that. And there he is. Ricardo Raquel coming out of the corner, putting on a nice move to beat his defender. Kind of loses control. The puck goes through a crowd back to the point. And then Andy Walensky makes no mistake, just steps into that puck with the one-timer. It goes through the crowd, point shot, into the net. 1-0 Anaheim halfway through the first. So, 
I'm going to give you another chance here to take it back. I mean, he has a good shot. <laughs> He's been a good power play producer for the goals for, for a while now. And my issues with him isn't the offense that he can produce. It's right. kind of his. I think there's no question what he can do with the puck. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, actually, let's let's take that back a little bit, because I think that the trap that we fall into uh, with prospects is that we kind of all agree what they can do, but we kind of don't seem to recognize the extent or the degree to which they can do it. So, for example, Andy Walensky, puck moving defenseman can make plays. Right. That's the tagline. But is he an NHL level puck mover? Is he a second pairing to first pairing puck mover? We just kind of agree that he yeah. can do X thing, but we don't really then consider can he, you know, this is to me, this was kind of the Troy Terry quandary in the beginning of the season where people were saying, well, look, he's got these hands, he can shoot. Playmaker. And then, right. But then it's like he's not doing it right now. It's he doesn't have the NHL asset yet. Now we're seeing it, right? And with Andy Walensky. Yeah. I mean, he's going to be 26 sooner rather than later. May not be with the organization again next year. He is a group six unrestricted free agent uh, this summer. And so, I mean, look, I think that, you know, if he kind of finds the right role, the right situation, I mean, he, you could argue Anaheim could be that situation, but it just kind of hasn't really happened for him. Yeah, he's going to be 20. He's going to be 26 in uh, about 31 days, 32 days. So. I don't know. If you haven't really cracked the NHL at that point, it's hard to say. I think he can still be a good depth guy for a lot of teams in the right system. But as far as Anaheim is concerned, I think that the ship may be sailing. It may it may have set for the for the high seas. Yep. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. So, <laughs> um, I mean, uh, let's let's give him his uh, his praise, though. This was a very nice shot. Puck ended up sneaking up to him found a way to put it in the net, and it's his first NHL goal. So congratulations to Andy Walensky for getting his first yeah. NHL goal. This is a moment that he's not ever going to forget. Um, and, yeah, and he beat a goalie that's actually been pretty good the last little bit in Mike Smith. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. It's it's a nice play. And, again, I think he has the tools to do it at the NHL level. Um, we just have to kind of see him fit. He's a guy who's going to need the right fit. You know, a lot of guys are like that. And there's not yeah. too many guys like Connor McDavid who can just, you know, or a Kut- even a Kutrab who can just step in anywhere and be great right away. By the way, this is a total aside. Connor tangent McDavid, time. C- tangent time. Uh, Connor McDavid has, I believe, uh, 114 points right now. Does he really? When did that happen? He has 114 points, and uh, Leon Draisaitl has 47 goals. Didn't they both so, like have hat tricks or something like that recently? Yeah, they, they 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 both had big nights the other night. But McDavid has 40 goals and 74 assists. That's... Look at it this way: the Oilers have Connor McDavid, who has 114 points, Leon Draisaitl, who has 47 goals and 101 points. They have two 100-point scorers. I mean, this is insane. And then you go all the way down the line and you have Ryan Nugent Hopkins, who's also had a very good season. And they're still and and they're in the draft lottery. I mean, the degree to which. So sorry, Nugent Hopkins is 65 points. The degree to which. Which is still good. Peter. Yeah, which is still great. Yeah. To the degree to the degree to which Peter Shirelli is an awful GM just cannot be understated. The Luchas contract. the There's a lot of apologists out there, and you can say whatever you want about Lucic, about Larson, but he he couldn't he could have done all of that and still put together some kind of offensive depth around those guys and couldn't do it. And there you go. That's what you're left with. Yep. A, just a, a disaster season. So Ducks fans, hopefully that made you feel Kut- a little better. Kucherov's there. at 121 points now. By the way, he's got to be careful. He's got. A, oh, by the way, Alex Ovechkin at forty nine goals. So one more. God, offense is and up. And Ben Bishop leading the league in save percentage. Offense is up. Offense is up. <laughs> uh, Mark Giordano would tie this game up for Calgary. Four and a half minutes left in the first period. P- puck comes across the zone. Of course, nobody from Anaheim able to corral it. Giordano gets a really nice slapper off coming off the boards. Just kind of handcuffs Ryan Miller. He's not able to get a get any type of 
uh, gear on it with his blocker. It goes right through him. That would be 1-1. And that would really be the last time that we would hear from Anaheim in this game, you know, competitively speaking. The game, you could argue, was pretty tight till about halfway through. And then something happened that made Jake really sad. <sighs> Troy Terry. Why? Hurt. Hurt. <laughs> So Troy Terry, the the uh, what was it? The uh, Calgary Flames end up winning the faceoff. It ends up going to the point. Troy Terry comes out to challenge, uh, challenge the shot, and ends up blocking it with his skate. And it looked like from a replay, it hit right on the uh, the tongue of the skate, right at the laces, and mm-hmm. probably right underneath the shin pads, in a very 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 painful spot. And so, uh, yeah, it, it's it doesn't look good he did couldn't really put any pressure on it any weight on it got to the bench ended up going to the back and uh yeah i don't know it it did not look good ended up being questionable return with a lower body injury we all know what the injury Mm -hmm. was um so yeah it it doesn't look good though for terry moving well if he he misses the rest of the season i mean is it so bad for anaheim uh not necessarily because he's been one of their best players. If we're talking about in terms of the tank, in terms of my enjoyment right. of watching the games, my enjoyment of watching the games will go down because I enjoy watching Troy, Troy Terry as everyone here knows. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anyone is really confused about that at this point. Um, 16 minutes, 16 minute mark in the second period. Um, Elias Lindholm brings it into the Anaheim zone, plays it back to Rasmus Anderson who blasts it on net. And Sean Monaghan is, I mean, this is just a hard play to look at. He drives to the net. Jacob Larson doesn't even notice Sean Monaghan going to the net. I mean, we're not even talking about being a little late. He just doesn't even account for the possibility that a guy may be driving to the net. Um, And that's not even considering, um, you know, the fact that Derek Grant, of course, I mean, magic Derek Grant just let Sean Monaghan get through. I mean, again, this notion that Derek Grant is this responsible two-way center, you know, he seems to have earned the trust of his coaches, but there are just so many examples like this where it's just, man, I am I just seeing the wrong thing? Am I just looking at something else here? I don't know. Um, and then almost perfectly halfway through the second period, halfway through the night, uh, Sean Monaghan would rip a shot off of rebound once again. Um, and then that actually deflected in off of James Neal for a power play goal. So, by the way, um, James Neal, who was brought over on a, let's call it a not a non-insignificant in, contract uh, to the Flames this summer. I mean, on the year, he has uh, five goals and 10 assists in 58 games. 15 points, James Neal. Yeah, he's never really been able to hit his stride with the Flames. It's just, I don't know if it's usage. I remember he started the season, wasn't he starting the season with uh, Monaghan and Goodrow and just never really was able to click? I mean, he signed a five-year deal, $28.75 million. There's four years left of that after this year. Should we make a friendly wager on if he finishes that contract with the Flames? <laughs> uh, yeah, most likely he does not. I think we're going to agree on that one. So not a whole lot of reason to wager. Um, so that would make it 3-1 Calgary. Again, almost perfectly halfway through the game. Uh, Derek Ryan, almost said Derek Grant. Uh, Derek Ryan would skate it into the net and deflect TJ Brody's shot past Ryan Miller to give the Flames a 4-1 lead in the third period. And then none other than Garnet Hathaway uh, would redirect uh, Travis Hamannick's point shot in and to the net. And, you know, this was after uh, they had just missed a wide open net and somehow uh, Ryan Miller was able to keep that out. Although I think it just missed. And then with less than a minute, in the game, about 50 seconds, uh, Sean Monahan would get a second goal of the game. Uh, basically just rips home a one timer. No chance for Ryan Miller, who was visibly frustrated after that goal. 6-1 Calgary. Just kind of a rough night for the Ducks. Yeah. Defensively, especially. So this game, um, they actually did a decent job uh, in the first basically period and a half in terms mm-hmm. of. So let's go to give me one sec. I will get it set up for us. But I'll show some uh, information from the different stats websites out there on tonight's game 
But once I get to it, give me one quick second here. Bear with me. One. Um, so as you can see on the night in terms of shot metrics, and this is game flow on the night at five on five, um, you can see that the the shots were pretty even um, pretty much up until midway through the game. And then the Flames just kind of took control and ended up getting a fair amount of the shots and a fair amount of the chances as that uh, second and third period went on and so the Ducks did a decent job and the only issue is a lot of the shots were from right in front of the net and so if you also go and look at scoring chances you'll see the same thing if you look at the scoring chances on the night um, they're all kind of from in front of the net area right yeah I mean it, it was it was just kind of one of those rough games overall I mean if you look at the defensive pairings um you know, no one really standing out whatsoever. Yeah. Magna holes are very rough game. Those two have not been good together whatsoever. Um, I mean, I don't think they've had one good game together. Um, Fowler, yeah. Walensky predictably struggled in this game. And then Larson uh, and, then and Lin Lindholm together. Lindholm Larson just not good at all. I mean, I, I think the Ducks are in a rough way right now with some of these pairings. I mean, it sounds weird to say, but missing Brendan Gooley is kind of ma making it difficult yeah. for Bob Murray, and then obviously the, the absence of Josh Manson. So I don't know. I mean, it's – I know Jacob Larson had a good stretch, you know, halfway through the season, and I, I wrote a, a pretty nice article about and him even, at the time. But he, he's, he even was pretty good once he got called back up in this last little bit. But. I'm, 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 I think I'm going to just say I'm in wait-and-see mode for him. I'm not writing know. him off, but I'm just kind of – let's let's see. Let's see, you know. So I think if we were to break this game game down into positives. Positives yes, we are, should probably get onto that before we lose everyone. Yeah. Positives for the night is as you're looking at this individual expected goals, Max Jones and Corey Perry individually had pretty good nights. Max Jones had a really good chance on a shorthanded breakaway actually right in the lead up to right before the Calgary first goal where he had a nice little uh, move on Mike Smith but was not able to drag it enough and mm -hmm. was not able to bury it. Puck ends up coming down the neck or the other way, ends up on uh, Mark Gianda Giordano's stick, who's able to fire it past uh, Ryan Miller. Corey Perry had a couple really good chances also from right in front of the net. One of them led to a um, hooking uh, penalty by the Flames and got a power play for the Ducks. So there's some pauses, I think. We also saw before Troy Terry got hurt, we saw that that line of uh, Terry, Steele, and Sherwood we're pretty good on the night from 81% in terms of expected goals, four percentage. If we go down and just purely look at shot metrics um, on the night and go to the ducks forward lines. If you look at uh, Troy Terry, uh, Sam Steele, Kiefer Sherwood, 53% Corsi, four percentage, 67% uh, scoring chance, four percentage and uh, no high danger chances, but still um, really good. Yeah, on I the mean, night. I mean, they, they were really good again. I mean, they've, you know, they had a really good game, obviously, against Vancouver. And then tonight, in you know, kind of limited action, they were they were good once again. And so remains to be seen what that what those three can look like when the games really do matter. But I mean, it's an encouraging sign for well, the Ducks. And so um, one theory, I really, have... re really no line struggling tonight, by the way, it was it seems like the well, issues were mostly in the defensive and, zone. Well, I think the issue that ended up happening was none of the lines per a lot of different line numbers. uh struggled tonight and that's largely due to the fact that the team the game was played pretty even um the flames power play had a pretty big impact on this with the power with one of the goals coming right after the power play it ended in another power play goal coming for the flames and right after that power play goal which would have been the third goal of the game for the flames um that was when troy terry got hurt and i'm not out here saying what felix probably thinks i'm saying in the sense of Troy Terry goes out, makes an, this huge negative impact on the team. What I'm saying is it ended up messing up all the lines and kind of caused them to have to shift things around and mess mess with kind of the different line composition and different things that they had going. And you can see right after Troy Terry got hurt, there's a pretty sharp drop-off in terms of the Flames generating a lot of the chances on the night. And so I really kind of think that that Terry injury took this team. Yes, they were already down 3-1, to one, but they were playing decent. After that mm -hmm. point is kind of when it went downhill. And so that's why we see the forward line numbers kind of still looking all right is because the forward lines ended up all having to get it shifted around after Terry went out, whereas the D pair stayed the same. By the way, Jake, uh, we have this coming from uh, the AHL right now. 
after at the end of the second period between Bakersfield and San Diego, Dallas Aikens and Brandon Manning going nose to nose as they walk off the ice, kind of jawing at each other. Interesting. So there you go. Interesting. Interesting. Dallas Aikens willing to go to war uh, for his team. By the way, uh, as at the time that we're recording this Friday night, it is three to one Bakersfield um, with just about twelve forty eight left in the third period. So um, that's obviously a good one. Bakersfield is very good this season, I should mention. Um, anyway, that's enough AHL talk. Um, but I'm going to throw in another tangent because the Angels just scored. Oh, they did. Cole Calhoun, RBI double. I don't have the the game on my phone anymore. Bases loaded right now, people. The Angels are going for it, trying to get this win. They will, First they win will of the not season. Go, they will not go the entire season without a run. That much we can do. Maybe we'll do an Angels podcast this summer. Maybe. I, Maybe I for patrons nothing, if they want to. I know nothing about baseball, and I'm, I might be willing to do it. We'll see. Just, just to fill the summertime air. Anyway. So I think we've talked quite a bit about this game already. Um, again, one thing I really want to highlight is that Steele, Terry, and Sherwood looking good together once again. Uh, defense struggling tonight. But should we get into some questions here? Uh, really quickly, I did want to say this on the game tonight. Um, mm-hmm. That, as I transition us out of that screen, um, I, I think that this game kind of highlighted, yes, Troy Terry going out and shuffling all the lines kind of really made some things uh, get a little bit of out of whack and out of order. And it ended up kind of causing the Ducks to, especially in the third period, chase the game and not really be on the front foot. But we really kind of saw the difference between between the Ducks, which as great as they've been playing this little last little bit of the season, they're still not playing perfect hockey. They need a, They don't have a head coach still. They're still... Kind of, you can see that they need a little well, bit more structure. I mean, tonight, they need... they're also just missing a lot of people. True. I mean, and but my point in right. saying all of this is, we see the difference between mm. um, between the Ducks and a, yes, a contending NHL team and a team that's still figuring yes. it out. Yes, and so I think even with Getzloff, with all of the guys, this Flames team is still better than the Ducks, and we kind of saw what they do well. In oh, that so they're... you're saying that this entire season can't just be blamed on injuries? No. Wow, what a concept. What a concept. Uh, I would have never I would have never yeah, imagined yeah. Also, that it was more than just injuries. Also turning this around, uh the uh the Flames are very very good. They are very good. They are kind of they're kind of like the Sharks in that I'm worried about their goaltending, but I guess I'm a little less worried, which is weird to say because I still think that Mike Smith is worse than Martin Jones, even though he's playing better than him right now. I trust as, as much as I agree with that. I trust small sample size when it comes to playoffs. I trust the I guy mean, who's hot. But you, you just have no idea who that, I mean, you have no idea if that's going to continue. That's the thing. Um, I don't know. I, I think I like San Jose's team better overall, but not by a lot. I mean, the flames, the Flames kind of have it all as well. I mean, they have really good forwards, as we saw tonight. They have a, a, a good blue line. Deficiencies in net, obviously, but Mike Smith can get hot. If there's one thing he can do, it's not look absolutely terrible yeah. for a stretch of time. Martin Jones, you know, he's he, he has been very good in the playoffs in the past, and so if playoff Jones shows up, the Sharks are going to be fine, but that... That again, and this is something I talked about weeks ago. Sharks school the Knights first round could be very interesting. Could be very I interesting. Hate, I really hate that. I'm probably gonna have to admit you're right, dude. I saw Vegas I really up it. close. I saw them up close. They are very good. I really hate them that I'm gonna have to admit <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is more because of the Sharks undoing. Uh, but the the Golden Knights are six three and one in their last ten playing good hockey angels so. just tied up the game with a walk oh my goodness we're gonna become a we're just gonna by by the by the 82nd game of the season we're just gonna be talking about baseball for 90 percent of the, of the podcast so, sorry people out there sorry i remember uh oh why am why am i spacing on his name so hard but uh one of our good listeners who's been listening to it for us for or to us for a while is a pretty big uh mariners fan i apologize oh. that i'm forgetting your name right now that's but, brutal um the yeah. mariners are good the mariners are playing very good baseball right now we're two games into the season 
Small sample size. There are 162 Tr- games. Trust the small sample size. J- j- just to be very clear about how small of a sample this is, uh, this is... <laughs> Wait, I have to make sure I get this right. This is 1.2% of the season. So... Sure. All right. The Dodgers. The Dodgers are winning. Dodgers. Are they guaranteed to, are they guaranteed to win the, the the World Series now? Uh, here's your 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 uh, now going to be uh, every podcast baseball segment until the Angels are awful I and I, I don't want to pay attention to anything. I, uh, I'm here. I, I am here for a good Angel season. I'm uh, here for it because you know what? A they have Mike Trout, which honestly you almost don't need a B when you bring that up. Uh, but they have a fun team, and they've I think that they've they've kind of. It seems like they've built this team the right way, and they're in a fun division. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm here for it. Yeah. All right. So we get in. Let's get into some questions. So for those of you watching this Twitch stream, or not this Twitch stream, if you're watching the recorded version of this on YouTube or listening to the recorded version of this show on your favorite podcast app, whether that be the Apple Podcast, whether that be Stitcher, whether that be SoundCloud, um. We do a live stream of this show each and every podcast at twitch.tv slash Anaheim Calling SBN where you can watch us live and interact with us live and support us. If you have Twitch Prime, if you have Amazon Prime, sorry, then you get Twitch Prime and you get it completely free to you. And that's a way for you to help support this show in a way that is, like I said, completely free to you. All you have to do is link your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. Then you hit that subscribe button. Felix, point above your head. Felix, point above your head. Right above Felix's head, hit that subscribe button. It helps us out a lot. So let's get into some questions. The Padres so, might be very good. The Padres <laughs> probably are going to be good. Uh, Bonnie <laughs> chimed in said, Injuries are not everything, but they contribute. Lack of line consistency, practice, knowing where your partner is. Sure, you can argue that the other team is better ad nauseum, but how can uh, you fight teams that haven't had as many horrific man-loss games? I mean, yes, in a, in a very in a very macro or sorry, micro sense in a, in one game, they can hurt and even stretching it out. They can really hurt. But I think that for the ducks this season, I think that we saw a lot of this stuff coming with some of the way that they played, you know, in previous years and being injured, just kind of laid it all bare, you know, just kind of really put it all out there. The fact that, you know, they do have some deficiencies and, you know, when we look back on the season, I think that the injuries, they didn't just they, – that wasn't, to me, maybe that's what did in this season specifically. But what it did do was – it. what it definitely did do is it just kind of pulled back this facade the Ducks have had for a couple of years now where we kind of assume they're going to be competitive, but they're not really contenders. The injuries just kind of ripped that away and said, look, there are issues here that need to be addressed. And – here they are. I mean, now they're, I think, in a better play. You know, it sounds weird. A team that's missing the playoffs, that's lottery bound, that maybe had playoff hopes before this season. I do believe that they are in a better place now than they were at the beginning of the year. Because I think that now they have realized what the issues were. They have recognized and accepted. They have gotten rid of a coach that I don't think was helping them. They have made some important trades. And I think that there's more to come. So to me, Yes, again, we've talked about this so many times. This season was, is, has been really difficult for the Ducks, but I do think that this was kind of necessary, a season of pain uh, moving forward. Yeah, and I think overall the season of pain could be good. And one thing I do want to talk about on this is, Bonnie, when we talk about the that, uh, but injuries and that different type of stuff, is the fact that injuries to a certain point were an excuse used by di- various segments um, of media and different things, but the team is injured, but the team is injured. And at a certain point, though, the team wasn't that injured. The back the back end was fine. They had everyone there. They, right. Everyone... During, during the 13-game losing streak, they were not that and, badly injured. And so I think when we bring up the injuries, we also need to focus on, yes, there have been injuries, but part of that is Perry being out for an extended period of time. Part of that is Ryan Kessler being out, which, as we're now seeing, isn't exactly a negative on the team, seeing as he was providing a negative impact on the roster. And so I think kind of I agree with Felix in the sense of the injuries almost up to a certain point almost just are an excuse. And it kind of it kind of pulled back the curtains on this team that they just there were issues bigger than the injuries, if that makes sense. And so, yeah, injuries play a part. Like, let's be real. 
but every single team has injuries. Every single team deals with them. Every single team goes through stretches with them. Um, the Ducks have been relatively lucky. That, actually, no, they haven't. I was about to say they've been relatively lucky with goaltending, but Gibson's been out at various points. Miller's been out at various points because I was going to say, Tampa Bay, even, they lost um, Vasilevsky for an extended period of time and were rolling out Louis Domingue in, in mm. goal. They've not had Victor Hegman. I mean, San Jose hasn't had Eric Carlson for most of the season. They've had Evander Kane with, out with injuries. Every team kind of deals with injuries. Yes, the Ducks are um, dealing with a fair amount of them, but a lot of times what those injuries do is they they test the depth of the team, the depth of, depth of the organization, and the players that need to step up. And we saw that kind of the way the roster was constructed with the coaching staff was not set up to do that previously. Yeah, no, I agree there. So uh, let's get into this question from Hardcore Luchador. Sean said, uh, who comes up to replace Troy Terry? If he is out, <laughs> uh, man, because this is... is something that uh, George brought up also that Terry going out could be bad for the goals. I mean, okay, yes, of course, but let's be honest that the the goals have been kind of short for a, a while now. Um, so I mean, you know, losing another guy at this point probably not going to, you know, be make or break. Um, I mean. I think that if you look at their roster right now, um, there's definitely a number of possibilities. Do we see Kevin Waugh come back up? That may be the name. Yeah. I mean, I, I could see Kevin Waugh being the guy. Um, outside of that, I mean, it's really hard to say. Maybe we see Pat- a Patrick Eves cameo to end the season. Um, outside of that, I mean... I, I, you know, to me that those are the two most likely, which, and, and I think that the gap between Kevin Wan and Patrick Eves is very, very wide. Yeah. So, well, and my pick Patrick, would be Kevin Wan. Patrick Eves isn't even playing right now. Right. That's what I'm saying yeah. is that I, I, I don't even think it's very likely that he comes yeah. up. And I oh, think got that it. Got probably, it. Got it. And, and I think that he's probably the second likeliest guy. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe what they do is they call up Eves to give him a curtain call type game. Yeah, that's that, that that's what I'm saying. I mean, I think that if he comes up, it, it's just to kind of play a couple shifts in the last game or two. Yeah. Uh, but they they still need somebody for those next two games. Yeah. Or, well, I guess there's three games. Well, left that now, that's why yeah. that's why I'm thinking if they were to do that, if he's set on retiring, if he has, and as Bonnie pointed out in our chat, Eves is actually ill, so it all depends on if he has the energy to get out there and skate a shift a shift or two if they want to do that in a game that at the end of the day may not matter as a way to honor him, let him kind of finish his career on his terms. If that makes sense, um, that Mm -hmm. would allow him to do that. Um, Whether that be against the flames, whether that be at Honda center, whether that be against the Kings at Honda center. Right. Yeah. I mean, I could definitely see that. I think that him and Wa are the most likely. Yep. All right, so do do do. Let's go to this question from Lewis. Question for Felix: Did you see the Warriors openly taunt the refs tonight? And he said that was funny <laughs> as hell. Yeah, I saw Curry hit that that huge three at the end of overtime, and then just openly taunt the ref. And then maybe, as fate would have it, they lose on a really bad call. So there you go. <laughs> yep. 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 Oh, I did want to bring up, um, so people throw some questions if you got them in the chat, but I did want to bring this up. Um, Tonight overall, in terms of the tank, a very, very good night. Not just because of the Ducks um, losing, which is good for the tank, but also with what has happened around the league. You also had the New York Rangers picking up a win, which is big for the Ducks. They're now one points back of the Ducks with a game in hand. You have also the Buffalo Sabres uh, lost in overtime yesterday. So they're two points back of the Ducks with two games in hand. And then you have the Detroit Red Red Wings picking up a win tonight, making them four points back of the Ducks with the game in hand. So there is time. Um, Manuel is saying that uh, Manuel 79 is saying Kevin Waugh is injured, actually. <laughs> well, then maybe ben Cali, Cali, Cali Kosala comes up and Devin Shore moves back to the wing. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. All right. <laughs> I need there. They are so thin. Tony brings us up Kempafu, and I think that this is an interesting. I don't know if it's an interesting talking point, but it's something that I think 
people do talk about, so we should probably mention it. He said, although I don't agree with the sentiment, I've seen a lot of people calling for Getzloff captaincy. Do you think there's any logic in, to something like that after a bad uh, season? And if so, who well, do you think it would go to? Two things. A, I don't think there's really a replacement. And B, I don't think it matters. I don't think that that's what's ailing the Ducks. It's something off ice, something chemistry related, leadership related. Um, I think that it's the roster. It's the coaching. It's these tangible things. Um, and as far as who could replace him, I mean, I personally don't see a replacement for a captain like Getzlaff on this roster. I mean, if we were to speculate on who could be potentially next, I could see them considering Cam Fowler because he's been around the longest on this team, even though he is, I guess, relatively young for a non kind of Crosby McDavid like captain. Um, I don't know. Maybe Jakob Silverberg would be a guy. I mean, he's another guy who's been around, who's been through the battles. Uh, I don't know. Who else could you see getting the captaincy? If it, let's say if it weren't gets slapped on this team. Fowler's the next captain. I, I yeah. really hold true to that statement. Yeah. I mean, it seems pretty likely just with the experience and everything else but, that are considered. But, 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 but. I don't foresee this happening. I, I think that. Yeah, I mean I, that, that that's the thing is that I don't see Fowler being around long enough to oh, both no. what get I, the captaincy and have Fowler re- and have Getzloff retire. I more so meant I don't foresee Getzloff being stripped of the captaincy. I think that that oh, is. Oh well, yeah. I think that that's not going to happen. It, it's kind of nonsense. It's something done by different segments of the fan base that kind of believe that Getzloff isn't a good leader, that he is not a good player. Those are the same type of, it's just, it, it, I don't know. I, I just, I really, really disagree with that statement, to be honest. I I think that Getzloff is one of the best players in the history of the fan base. I actually think that if you had to, uh, if you kind of made, forced me to give you an answer of who is the most important player in the history of the Ducks fan uh, franchise, I would say it's Ryan Getzloff. He is the best player to ever put on a uh, a duck sweater. He's going to be the captain for the most games ever. He's going to lead the team in all points categories. Maybe you could argue that Tamu Solani at his peak was better than Ryan Getzloff, sure. But because of the longevity, because of the amount of games, because of everything that is being put in by Ryan Getzloff, he is the best player, and he is should be the captain. And for everything he's done for this franchise, for all the time and effort, for all the injuries, for everything he's put in, he deserves to wear that captaincy sweater until he decides he's done. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a whole lot to say to that. I I don't really see anyone else in line to replace him. And I mean, as far as the greatest players to play for the franchise, it's probably him or Solani, maybe Korea. You can throw in there. Korea. Maybe Perry has a seat probably at that table somewhere. Perry's a little bit lower on that table, but he's there. Yeah, but but he's he's in that group. I mean, the Ducks haven't been around for that long, even though it's it's been 25 years now. Uh, but so Perry, I think I would put him in that group. Um, I don't know. No no love for uh, no love for Patrick Maroon, Bobby Ryan. Nope. <laughs> Patrick Patrick Maroon. What a random name to throw in there. I don't know. I just felt like throwing something in that would that would make you upset. That was it's a okay. very very random name to throw in there. <laughs> you should have thrown in like a Steve Ruchin. Yeah, Bobby Dallas, Guy Bear. Yeah, uh, Jay Shiger should be on that list. We gave him some uh, props. Was that on the Patreon episode that we talked about Jay Shiger? I don't remember now. All these podcasts are starting to blend together at this point. <laughs> Hardcore Luchador calling us out saying it's going to be Fowler. We just don't understand how good he is on the advanced invisible stats. Hey, he's calling I mean, you out, not me. I, I have, well, no, you're tagged in there, brother. Oh, God, I forget um, that that account is mine also. I I mean, I'm not doubting that Fowler's probably well-liked in that locker room. You know, he seems very well-spoken, seems to really care. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any issue with that. I mean, and even if I did, there's no way of knowing if that would be accurate or not. Yep. So All right. I, I choose to grade players on things I can see. That's usually how I go about it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's end with this comment. Um, mm-hmm. It's not a question, but I think it's a valid kind of point to make um, in terms of the defense. And this is something I think that we've kind of made the point of that. I want, we want to see this defense core with a new coaching staff before any, I granted Brandon Montour has gone now. 
So there has been major curious. surgery. We've talked I'm about not, it. You have. I'm not that I, curious. You have gone on record saying it. I mean, I mean, I, I think that if you really want to know what they could be without making any changes, yeah, give them another year yeah. with a different coach, see what's going on there. But I'm not so, so curious that you just write off the possibility of trading one of them if there's a good deal to be made. Yep, and so the the comment is Manuel79 said, FYI, last year, everyone, myself included, um, thought about the Calgary defense uh, where, uh, uh, sorry, let me restart that. Uh, for what it, or for your information, last year, everyone, myself included, thought the Calgary D were done, and this year they, had, they have a major bounce back. The comment is for yeah. the doom and gloom. Basically, Bill Peters came in and turned that yeah. defense that everyone was down on, they missed the playoffs, and kind of turned them around, and now, like we talked about, Calgary is good. Yeah, I also would like to say that I think their guys are better. I think that even before um, before they... Are we sure? You know, People were down on Hamannick last year. People were really down on Hamannick. He, yes, they were down on him because of how he was playing, but they were everyone loved that trade when the yeah. Ducks, or sorry, when the Flames acquired but him. Sound because fam- he was good for the Islanders. Sound familiar really with how? Sound familiar with how people were evaluating Fowler? They were all in love with him a year or two ago, and they just played. I mean, poorly. people have been loving Fowler since he got drafted. I and, mean, yeah, but there there are plenty of people that never, were critical that's of him. Never been there's never been a match. With he had a good bounce back. Have... He had a good bounce back two or three years ago. Yeah, I, I mean, sure, but the the point is, is that um, you know, to me, if you looked at Calgary's infrastructure, it was stronger than Anaheim's. And yeah, I know that Hampus Lindholm and Josh Manson are great together, but outside of that, I mean, there's not really a whole lot left. I mean, you're you're really just arguing that, like, we know that Lindholm and Manson can be good under any circumstance because they were great under Randy Carlisle. Um, and so to me at this point, you're pretty much just looking to see if Fowler, Fowler and, and Gooley and whoever, if it's not Gooley, someone they bring in can be good. Um, so really this is all kind of all about Fowler. I mean, cause you know, you're not going to move Josh Manson. His contract is cheap. He's he, you know what you have in him, you know, yeah. so long as he's playing with, with, uh, Hampus Lindholm, but Hampus Lindholm has a great contract. He's young. There's no reason. I mean, if they moved him, that would just be a mistake short of them getting some surefire, you know, kind of blue chip guy, which he kind of is himself. So that would still be a tough trade to justify. So outside of that, really, what is there left to evaluate? Really, it comes down to can Fowler plus mystery player, whether that's Gooley uh, or Andy Walensky or whoever it is, can that work? So I have seen almost enough of Fowler, maybe even already enough to know that what kind of what we're going to get again, maybe Dallas Dickens is, is the camp Fowler whisperer and comes in and just turns things around completely for him. Hold no hope. They should not be so entranced with the idea that we have to see another year of camp Fowler because the first 10 just weren't enough. We just don't know. We needed one more year. Um, I don't know. I think that they, they can't let that paralyze them for making a deal. If there's a deal to be made, of course, you don't want to just trade Fowler because you just have to, you know, because you want to move on. I think that he is still a serviceable player. And, you know, if you keep him around, it's not the end of the world. So again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really shut off to any one idea here. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think it's about time to wrap this thing up. I do want to end it with something that has become a bit of a tradition that we've gone away from. It's time. How, how many do I get? How many do I get? Three. You you never say you never stick to it, but I'm just gonna say three. All right. So there's one, two. By the way, for those who can't see right now, oh. our beloved recorded version crowd, Jake is running the NHL draft lottery. Got similar. a third. He's already gone over the three that I prescribed here. I got he, I got a two. I got a two. Okay. We'll end it. We'll we'll stop it there. I, I'm happy with second. Okay, so the, so on Jake's last simulation out of about 11, he has the Ducks going second overall with Edmonton as the first overall pick. So there you go for those holding out hope that Edmonton doesn't get lucky once again. Um, last comments? Anything else you want to talk about here before we get on out of here? No, you have I've, a drive to make to Temecula. I do have a drive to make to Temecula for my cousin's wedding tomorrow. Yeah, it's wedding season, I guess. Wedding I was at a season. wedding last weekend. 
I'm and Jake's going to be at one tomorrow night. You're driving. You're going to cross county lines. Cross county. I cross county lines every day. You're going from L.A. County to Orange County to Riverside County. So now you're going inland. Just going shout lots out, of different ways. Shout out to our inland empire folk. We appreciate you. Um, anyway, is Riverside considered inland empire? I think so. For those for for, for you nine oh niners out there, let me know. Um, anyway. Thanks a lot for tuning in tonight, guys. We really do appreciate it. Um, we just recorded our second Patreon episode of the month. Go check that out. That's patreon.com slash acpod. I got to say, it was a fun one. We had another debate, another controversial debate. And this one was about, I believe, Pop-Tarts? Yes, Pop-Tarts. <laughs> Pop-Tarts, is, Pop-Tarts is a tagged item in the article. So yep. that's, a, that's a sure sign of a good time. We, we did a preview for what Ducks players might go play in the World Championships. Uh, we talked about the Ducks a little bit more, um, just kind of big picture stuff. And, of course, the Pop-Tart debate. Oh, and free agency talk for what who the Ducks may target. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. That, again, that's patreon.com slash acpod. And for $5 a month, you get two bonus episodes. They're a lot of fun. It's worth 5 bucks. trust me. Um, and you get access to our Discord chat. So you can yep, good time in there. join in on the fun. That's going to be a lot of fun, especially when the draft and free agency roll around. I think what we should do is just be in there permanently uh, during those events. We'll see. Yep. We'll, we'll, we'll make it work. We want, to make, we want to give you the most bang for your buck. Um, and then, of course, if you've been enjoying the show, um, make sure to go leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're listening abroad, if you're not in North America or not in the United States, we're still tracking the iTunes Canada, iTunes Great Britain. Yep. We're still Took tracking those. Jake yep. is tracking it down. Oh, no, we don't have anything new. Sorry. Oh, n- nothing new. But, yes, we do take a look. Um, and so don't be discouraged from uh, going on there and, uh, you know, letting us know what you think, letting us know how you've been enjoying the show because that helps us keep this thing going. Jake, you want to plug the YouTube one more time? Yeah, so if you go on YouTube.com and search Anaheim Calling SB Nation, you can find the recorded video version of this podcast where you get basically to see everything that – we have mentioned is on the screen, whether that is the lottery simulator, whether it, that is different stats. Uh, yep. So whatever it is, you'll be able to see it on the YouTube video. Absolutely. And then, of course, we are on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com. Just go search Anaheim Calling. Um, and we are on Stitcher. So pretty much wherever you enjoy your podcast, just search Anaheim Calling or Anaheim Ducks. We will be sure to pop up. And then, of course, check us out on social media. Uh, that's at Anaheim Calling on Twitter. Jake is on Twitter at Reindeer Games 91. I'm on there as well at Felix underscore Sicard. That's going to do it for us tonight, guys. Thanks for tuning in to this podcast. And we will be back either Saturday or Sunday to break down uh, the Ducks' third to last yes. matchup of the season. That one will pit them tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Saturday, against the Edmonton Oilers. And then after that, Two games left against the Flames and the Kings. So we've got one more week left with you. Literally uh, a week from today at about this time. Not literally, but uh, exactly one week from today. A little later than the time that we're finishing up this podcast. We will be wrapping up our final post-game show of the season. It's been one heck of a ride, but we're not done yet. So make sure to tune in this weekend for the Oilers episode. We'll talk to you then. Bye.